again, if you're just tuning in, you are listening to Think 100%, the coolest show on climate change. And I have a dear friend in the studio with us right now. Uh, he is an amazing just advocate, and he is an amazing just leader. Uh, we have Trip Van Noppen, who is the president of Earth Justice. Trip is has used uh, has been the president of Earth Justice for some time, and has used that uh, uh, platform to use literally have what we would call the Earth needs a good lawyer, um, and Earth Justice uses the legal process to protect our environment, its health. Um, Trip has a long history of fighting the good fight for the environment in court, including having spent time arguing for rights, employment, and toxic tort cases. He's a former member of the Southern Environmental Law Center and became director of the Commission's Carolina offices. So, without further ado, our good friend Trip, welcome. Thank you so much, Rev, and thank you, Mustafa. It's wonderful to be here, and congratulations on what a great show you've put together over the last few months. It's really terrific to see this taken off. Thank you, thank you. Well, Trip. I mean, well, thank you. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty because I know you. One thing I just want to say for those, this is on a personal note. Um, so I've known Trip for quite some time. We actually, Trip uh, runs Earth Justice, but we also are on the board together um, at the League of Conservation Voters. Um, so we've known each other for quite some time. And I just want to say this, that um, Trip gets it. What I mean when I say that is that he understands what it means to to want to broaden our movement. He is concerned about what happens to this planet um, for the future generations. And I think that he has a love for, he, I don't think, I know he has a love for humanity. But and Earth Justice is a, has become a powerful entity um, for our movement. So with that, you know, Mustafa, fire away. Thank you, Trip. Good to see you. Thank you. And welcome to the show. Um, so, you know, I think it's really interesting, you know, that Earth Justice um, is very nonpartisan in their work. I think sometimes folks may not realize that enough. I know myself working in, in the federal government there for a number of years. You guys didn't care if it was a Democratic or a Republican administration. If somebody wasn't doing what needed to be done, you guys made sure that you engaged them <laughs> vigorously in that process. So. I mean, that, that's really important. But we also know that vulnerable communities sometimes have a distrust of the legal system. Mm. We know there's some history, but that's behind that. Can you talk a little bit about what Earth Justice is doing to build authentic uh, sort of collaborative partnerships and relationships with communities? I certainly can, and, you're, and I know you're right that there's a lot of well, you know, well-founded distrust in communities of color about the legal system, particularly the criminal justice system. Uh, at the same time, there's a really powerful tradition of communities of color using the courts to advance a civil rights cause. And Earth Justice, in a way, was modeled on the work of the NAACP and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who pioneered the use of the courts to bring about social change in a way that had never really happened, not only here, but almost any, basically anywhere in the world. And some lawyers who were doing environmental work looked at that and said, we need to do that on the environment, too. So um, just to bring that back around, the, the problems that we're working on are faced most acutely by communities of color. And those communities have advocated for better environmental protection. They want to clean up the air in, in the neighborhoods that they live in. They want to clean up that power plant and that oil refinery that they live in the shadow of. And if all that work to change the rules and the laws doesn't get enforced and actually implemented, it wasn't much good for people. And so we've taken our you know historic work to try to work on national standards to clean up pollution and trying to bring it down to the community level to make it because it's not worth it unless we really make it work at the community level so we have lawyers whole team for example working in los angeles on air pollution that's making people sick from the port and the freight system that's connected mm -hmm. to the port and the oil refineries there we're working with native american tribes across in many parts of the country fighting fossil fuel mm -hmm. developments pipelines and terminals and refinery expansions. We're working with communities of color in states that are moving forward on clean energy transformation, like right here in Maryland and in New Jersey, where 
there's been good efforts at the state legislative level and in the state utilities commissions to get new standards passed so that solar energy is available to all, not only to people with single family homes who live in a neighborhood with a lot of sunshine. Mm -hmm. And so there's been some great work to, with groups in, on that in, in a lot of different states. It's really making a difference. Tripp, you were just talking about with Mustafa about the vulnerable communities and how they're distrust, but what are some of the recent examples of some of your OSHA's good work in these communities, like from the Bayou Bridge, some of the pipeline fights, COAS, what are some things that Earth Justice is doing right now on the legal side? Well, you know, the Trump administration has an all-out push to develop fossil fuels on the public lands and to make way for the oil companies to do what they want to do across, across the country. And we're working with communities to fight that everywhere we can. You mentioned the Bayou Bridge. That's not a bridge. It's a pipeline. That's right. It's an old pipeline. It's the last link in the, the tar sands pipeline coming all the way down to the Gulf Coast. It's going right through Cajun communities and the wetlands of, of southern Louisiana. And, and tell some folks about that recently because there was a victory, but then people are still building. Give some background on the Bayou Bridge pipeline. So the pipeline was approved without much environmental review and without going out and bringing it and having real community involvement. And, and once it was approved, they started building it as quick as they could. We took them to court, and the judge in that case in Louisiana, which is where the courts are pretty friendly to the oil industry, said, hold on, this has not been looked at closely enough, and actually stopped construction, which doesn't happen very often. So the uh, the pipeline company made an emergency appeal to the Federal Court of Appeals for what's called the Fifth Circuit, it's that Gulf Coast part of the country, and the court said, we're not going to stop construction while this review goes on. So it's still in litigation and it could still stop eventually, but that immediate injunction was lifted and they're back to building the pipeline. And you know, we saw that same cycle happen with the Standing Rock Pipeline. We were representing, with the Dakota Access Pipeline, where we were representing the Standing Rock Sioux, and the judge in that case said, said, well, I see legal problems with how they haven't taken the tribe's interests fully into account, the risk of an oil spill fully into account, but, uh, but I'm not going to stop construction while we review these legal matters and decide what to do. And it's a real problem. It's it's gotten to be harder to get a court order stopping something that's underway. If we have time before they start construction, it's, e it's easier to hold off construction than it is to stop it once it's started. Uh, but we're also working on issues of chemical exposure, like work. The, the Trump EPA right now is trying to postpone rules that during the Obama administration, we work with farm worker organizations on pesticide exposure for young people including children who are working in the fields and applying the pesticides to the plants. Wow. And this, these were rules that were long overdue to make things safer, safer for kids doing farm work. That's right. And the, the, the Trump administration says, well, we're not going to let those go into effect. We're going to delay you know, that requirement. And so we are taking them to court over that. That's the kind of thing we're doing with all these delays and backsliding that the Trump administration is trying to do. So, Trip, last week we had Whitney Tone from Green 2.0 on the show. Um, we had a, a very um, deep conversation about the lack of diversity that exists uh, in many of our green organizations. Uh, some of them are trying to move forward and, and sort of address some of that. Some of them still have some evolving to do, we'll say it that way. Um, and, and I know the work that Earth Justice does in partnership with lots of various communities of color across the country. Can you talk a little bit also about the organization and the structure and how you guys are working on getting more folks of color in leadership positions, middle management, in the door, you know, um, you know, first jobs, those different types of things? Yes, happy to talk about that. And Whitney Tome is doing a great job at Green 2.0. and she is. We were proud to, to support the Green 2.0 once it got going and still participate. Um, it's badly needed, this broadening, not only of the movement in terms of who the activists, but who are the staff working in these organizations and at all levels, from, from first job out of school to leadership positions and board of trustees or board of directors positions. And, you know, this country was changing demographically and politically and 
schools were becoming diversified and the military was becoming diversified and big corporations were becoming diversified and the environmental movement was not. We were like, you know, we would come to a meeting at the, at the Obama EPA and there's a multicultural group of people around the table waiting for this meeting and the environmental leaders would walk in and it was like Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republican leadership had just walked in the room with a bunch of old white men. And that just was not, that just cannot be the, the movement of, shouldn't have been the movement of yesterday, and it cannot be the movement of today or tomorrow. So, um, so we're, we're doing, a, we've changed a lot about practices and policies across the organization. We've trained intensive training of every single staff person, um, a lot of recruiting, and, and the culture change has to be really worked on, and it doesn't happen overnight. So we, you know, we find now where we've got to focus is at the work group level, at the team level where the actual work assignments are being made and the promotional opportunities occur and the professional development opportunities occur. We've done a great job at recruiting a much more diverse workforce and board at, at all levels of the organization. Um, but the culture change comes slow and it, it, it's a struggle we all need to be in and we're in that struggle. Uh, let me just ask this question real quick, Rev. Uh, Tripp, do you feel that we can win on climate and the environment if we don't diversify the movement? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And we learned that just smacked upside the head, learned that in 2010 when the Democrats controlled the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, and there was a lot of momentum to pass a national climate piece of legislation and it couldn't get to a vote in the Senate because the movement wasn't broad enough. There weren't enough people from enough different kinds of communities pounding on enough Senate doors to make that happen when it should have happened. So, Tripp, I'm, I'm going to keep that, that flow going because I think that you're, you're very unique, and I think, you know, I think that, you know, so if you can talk to your colleagues, I mean, I think part of the problem is that people have been discussing this. We know that climate change is real. Uh, people can see what, what will happen if we don't make changes. We know that we have to broaden the movement, but it seems like sometimes the the state of the current environmental movement doesn't want to do what it needs to do. So what can what what can you do? I know you are doing a lot to talk to them, but more, what more can folks who are part of that that movement today do to broaden it, to expand, adding culture, do things like we're doing today? I think it means, you know, my, my voice can be a voice for the fact not only that this needs to be done, but that it takes real focus and real work and ongoing work. It's not something that you have a two-year initiative and you shake your shake pat yourself on the back and you're done. It's a it's a lifelong learning journey, not only for an individual but for an organization. And uh, so, being a voice of support for people who you know, who dive into the work but then find it's hard, or it can be hard, or it can generate conflict. Uh, it can generate people having to do some soul searching. And it's amped up because we're in such a political pressure cooker of heightened, you know, ra visible racism in our country. And that penetrates inside an organization and people's feelings about you know, what's going on in the country, make it a more emotional topic and a topic more necessary to deal with, but also sometimes harder to deal with. So, so my voice is just, let's keep at it and don't think you can do it quickly and don't think it's going to happen overnight. So Tripp, I mean, we're, we're coming to the end. We, we have to figure out a way. I think when we go out to the Bay Area, we have to do a, a round two of this conversation with Earth Justice. But I actually want to ask you a question. This is because we're friends. Yes. Um, and one thing that we, we know a little, bit, a little bit about each other, we are both fathers and we talk about our kids to each other a lot. Um, and I hear you know about my kids and I know about your kids and I know you got kids that are doing documentaries now and good stuff like that and getting married and, and all, all the good stuff. Um, so if we can speak to, if you can speak to the next generation, um, as, as a father, because we're actually getting close to Father's Day. If you could speak to the next generation and explain why you fought so hard, 
why you did all you could do to try to curb um, our dependence on fossil fuels and, and you can speak to them speak to your, your children's children now you know they look back at us now we're, we're long gone but you can speak to our children's children for the next couple of minutes what, what would you want to tell them well when I was much much younger I looked out at the people the generation ahead of me older than me and felt like how can you be leaving this this world where at that time we were in, at war in Vietnam where we didn't belong pollution was happening destroying our natural resources and our and, and people's health um, the, the, I, I, this was basically the the very end of legalized segregation in the South and North Carolina where I was growing up um, and I could go on and on and I thought how can I, how can these people who be leaving us this world and I didn't want to leave my children and my grandchildren that world and I st still don't and things lots of things have changed and lots of things haven't changed and we, we got way more work to do and I I, I want you know, I want everybody who wants to play their part, now's the time to play their part. And if they're younger and can get involved, now's the time to do it. So. Well, Tripp, thank you so much. I've always said that demonstration without uh, uh, litigation uh, leads to frustration, and everything without legislation leads to frustration. So this week we have a march uh, uh, for the ocean, which is demonstration, but litigation is key. So if folks who are in this movement and they want to get more involved with Earth Justice, tell them how they can get more involved. How, how can they find Earth Justice? Well, the, you can find Earth Justice at earthjustice.org on, on the web, and we've got, on, the, on that site, you can sign up to get a regular flow of information and of action items, take action kinds of messages. Uh, you can see a lot of the stories that we, of the types of issues we've been talking about spelled out with a lot of video, a lot of a lot of visuals, a lot of storytelling there, a lot of the voices of the people that we're working with. You don't get just a lot of Earth Justice promo, you get, there's a lot of really good stories being told on, on that website, so I encourage people to go, sign up for the action alerts, take those actions because they matter, and, and we'll keep you informed. Well, Tripp, man, thank you. Um, I appreciate you. Um, keep fighting. Um, I know that if we as humans, black, white, brown, red, yellow, male, female, straight, gay, fierce, atheist, humans, we come together, we can win this thing. And I know we, we, we got to just what to win it. Thank you, brother. You're right. Appreciate you. And I want to thank those. Man, we have a, <laughs> thank you. We've we got a few folks, I guess, maybe we was, we was getting kind of foggy eyed in here, getting emotional, folks that are calling in. So I want to thank, um, I want to thank, uh, uh, Mark uh, Malika from Washington, D.C. for giving $50. I want to thank from Scott from Springfield, Virginia for giving $35. And I want to thank my mama, uh, Dr. Yearwood. I do it. She, she was that, 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 that dashing uh, cassava callaloo uh, jerk chicken would get, get her. But man, thank you, Dr. Yearwood. I love you so much, Doc. Uh, um, for this being, for me, as Tripp said, and for Mustafa being an activist for me that I can see. And with that, man, I just want to thank all y'all for being a part of Think 100%. Uh, 